I'm Liz Sauer, and this is Ghosts in the Burbs, a podcast of ghost stories from Wellesley, Massachusetts. A warning, adults who use adult language told me these frightening tales, these ghost stories, aren't for kids. Something wonderful happened this summer. Chris fell into the Walking Dead rabbit hole and binged all 10 seasons. Now he's on season 11. I fell off around season five, but that's neither here nor there. When he came home with three jars of peanut butter, I knew his conversion was complete. He's concerned that the fence around our yard won't keep out a horde, but it will slow down stragglers enough to put them down before they become a threat. Have I thought about getting a supply of plywood to cover the windows? You know damn well I have. We haven't really done much to actually prep for the apocalypse, but it's super fun to talk about. The what if of it all. It gives us something else to chat about after months of all the other what-ifs that aren't so much fun. Unfortunately, our next neighbor sucks all the fun out of the discussion because, according to her, there are no what-ifs. It's coming. It's just a matter of time. We're on to ghost story number 61. I swear to God, if this means we have to move again. The past 20 or so months have been a mind fuck for everyone, but for preppers, oh, what a confusing time it has been. At the start of things, it was relatively clear. Get your hands on some masks, disinfectant wipes, and hand sanitizer, then quarantine. Hole up as best you could, if you could, and be grateful for and kind to those who could not. Done and done and done. But the prepper in me knew that there had to be more. I sorted through the plastic bins in my basement, If the lights were out, we were covered. If the water went bad, we had filtration and those little disinfectant pills. But those things didn't seem likely. What good would my Bear Grylls fire starter be when I was facing down the barrel of remote learning? A solar-powered crank radio did nothing to assuage the isolation and loneliness. My stockpile of Starbucks via instant coffee offered no solace. We weren't at risk for scurvy. There was still plenty of fruit around. This wasn't the prepping I'd prepped for. I ordered a 12 pack of Dinty Moore stew. We're vegetarian. I brought it to the food pantry. Then I began stockpiling and freezing the coffee creamer Chris and I like, and we are still drinking our way through that hoard. Needless to say, it's no longer my favorite. I fixated on sweets, ordering Twinkies and Hostess cupcakes, a sort of, if everything goes to hell, at least we'll have these as a bright spot in the day plan. I just snuck down to the basement in the evenings and finished them off. I was flummoxed. This was not the world-shifting emergency I'd expected. I'd planned for a catastrophic weather event, an earthquake, rising seas, followed by anarchy, events that called for action. Quarantine called for stillness, for nothing, for a fuck ton of family togetherness. The goalpost kept moving. We would be through this in two weeks, by the end of April, May at the latest, next fall, when we're vaccinated, when they're vaccinated, after the booster, when we reached herd immunity. Never. I prepped for the wrong catastrophe. It knocked me off my little superior planning pedestal. I'm used to being wrong. I'm sure you've noticed I've been wrong here many times. I'm stopping the podcast. Nope, I'm starting it back up. Whoops, can't handle it, and remote learning, and on and on. Then there are the more cringy wrongs, the wrongs in which I touched on topics I had no business poking. Glorifying drunk mommy culture. Writing about hoodoo and Santa Muerte. Oof. I've been in the wrong and outright offensive so many times, and trust me, it's embarrassing. Humbling. Makes me want to shut this shit down and pretend it's all in the past. Which is what the old me would have done. But current me is willing to listen and say a simple and heartfelt I'm sorry. I'll learn and do better from here on out. But when I stumble again and offend you... I will listen and apologize again and hope for, hope you forgive me again. It's not easy being wrong. It's not easy to admit that you had a bad idea or that your beliefs, opinions, certainties were based on lies or misinformation. But sometimes that's just what you have to do. But fuck all if I'm going to just sit here and accept being wrong about the damn prepping. It feels too free and loose, as though I'd be tempting fate if I simply let go of the idea that someday my prepping will come in handy. So, 
After too much time doom scrolling Twitter, I continually find myself on Amazon filling my cart with seed packets and raised garden beds and composters and clothing lines and clips and better water filtration systems. And then I force myself to move all of it to this save for later shelf. We all want some semblance of control. Recently, I found mine by compulsively ordering half cords of firewood. That's where my anxiety and fear has landed. How the pandemic might land us in a situation where it is the dead of winter and without firewood, we would freeze to death in our home? I honestly don't know. I'm as irrational as the next person. I don't claim otherwise. But what if the worst thing did happen? The thing that actually threatened scurvy or made money obsolete and ensured that my instant coffee was the only thing standing between me and a trade that meant life and death. I mean, we know climate change is coming for all of us, and even though we have all the evidence in the world that it's moving at a faster clip, catastrophe sort of feels like a way off in the future thing, right? Well, I spoke to someone who thinks, no, she claims to know for sure that catastrophe is not a future thing. It's a soon thing, a really soon thing. How does she know? A sinkhole opened up in her backyard, and the things living inside of it told her so, in detail. Now, on the scale of stepping on a snake in the middle of the night to being left behind by a scuba diving boat in the dead middle of the ocean, sinkholes rank somewhere in the middle of my nature horror scale. After the following interview, I googled scary sinkhole stories, and after a little bit of reading, sinkholes leveled up in my list of nature-related fears. One particular article by The Week, called Seven Terrifying Sinkhole Disasters, was particularly haunting. According to the article, a 37-year-old man was in his Florida bedroom when the earth opened up, swallowing him and everything in his room whole. The expansive hole was about 20 feet wide and had been almost completely hidden by the house as it grew and shifted. Three days later, the search for his body was called off as the ground was considered too unstable and dangerous to continue. A sinkhole opened up beneath his bedroom. A sinkhole opened up beneath his fucking bedroom. In the article, this geography consultant in Tampa chillingly explained, there is no way of ever predicting where a sinkhole is going to occur. One appeared at Guatemala City on May 30th of 2010. It swallowed a three-story building and measures about 60 feet wide and 30 stories deep. In Illinois, a guy just dropped down 18 feet into a sinkhole that appeared out of nowhere on a golf course. After heavy rains, San Francisco sewers ruptured, creating a sinkhole measuring 240 feet long, 150 feet wide, and more than 40 feet deep. 40 feet. That's like a four-story building, give or take. My Google results suggested that Florida, Texas, and Mexico are some real hot spots, but sinkholes appear all over the world, even apparently in Wellesley. I mean, of fucking course we have sinkholes. Why wouldn't we? Ann Werner is a neighbor of mine. She lives on a long winding road lined with honest-to-God mansions. FYI, I don't live in a mansion. We snuck into this neighborhood by buying someone's pool house. Seriously. But we are surrounded by quintessential stately New England homes. Ann's is on the northern edge of her street. Her backyard slopes down to the Charles River, That same river that separates Boston from Cambridge. Stepping off her wide back deck, you descend a gentle hill before the yard flattens out and extends to the edge of the water. This part of the river meanders through weedy, snaking curves, its level rising and falling with the rains. This summer was a wet one, and you can see how high the water's gone by the muddy lines it's left on trees along the bank. There's a great walking path that skirts this part of the river, but the rainy summer brought with it mosquitoes in the billions, so I've been sticking to the road for my walks. Personally, I wouldn't want to live in a house beside that river. Or in Anne's case, a brick estate complete with tennis courts, swimming pool, and greenhouse. Rivers have always felt so sneaky, as though they could lull you into relaxation with their tinkly sounds and then reach out and grab you dragging you along into their murky depths forever. 
Dramatic, yes, but still, I don't like it. All opinions aside, Anne's property is dangerous. Her sister-in-law, Carly, is the one who reached out. She asked that I meet her at her sister-in-law's house. I wanted to hear their story in a neutral location, preferably Cafe Nero, but Carly was insistent. When I found out her sister-in-law lived just a couple blocks away from me, I agreed. I walked the short distance to Anne's home and found her and Carly waiting for me in the driveway. Oh, I totally recognize you, Carly declared happily. You have a Bernadoodle. Oh, sure, said Anne. I think I've seen you too. We didn't know what your whole COVID comfort level was, Carly said quickly. So we figured we'd head back and sit on the deck rather than going inside. Is that okay? I followed them along a brick pathway that wound along the side of the palatial home. I don't know enough about gardening and landscaping to speak to what was going on in that yard, but my God, it was beautiful. The wildflowers and tall grasses, evergreens, and Lord knows what kind of trees looked as though they'd always been there and someone had gently placed Anne's home right at the center of the scene. The gleaming white deck, which was either brand new or had been power washed recently because with all the damp we had this summer, I know there had been no escaping the constant creep of mildew, overlooked the yard, which rolled gently down to the edge of the river. Anne accepted my oohs and ahs graciously and led us to an umbrellaed table upon which sat a pink cake tray laden with donuts and a Starbucks coffee to go box. We hear you like sweets and coffee. Carly said, taking a seat and picking a strawberry frosted donut from the top of the pile. Anne placed a pretty scalloped Jaliska floral plate before me and passed me a pink linen napkin. Coffee? Yes, please, I replied happily, reaching for a glazed. We only have soy creamer. The grocery order hasn't arrived. Perfect, I said, stirring sugar into the dainty teacup. We fell into a comfortable silence, something I am not at all used to, but the slight breeze flowing through the trees and the unseasonably cool morning, coupled with the view, lulled me into a cozy calm. Carly picked apart her donut, actually knocking the sprinkles off onto her plate. You have a ghost with you now, right? I nodded. The women exchanged a glance. Before we talk about Anne's uh, problem, would you mind checking something for us? Sure. What's up? Are there any other ghosts around? I mean, other than your ghost. I sighed. Um, I'm sort of blocking things right now so I can focus on you guys, but I can open up if you're looking for someone. We would really appreciate it. We just want to know if there are any dead people around, like if they hang out here. Would you be able to tell? I think so. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath, then opened them and gazed around us. The river flowed almost imperceptibly past. The woods were quiet, save for the birds and the leaves brushing together in the breeze. No one's here at the moment. Are you certain? Yes. Good. Were you hoping for someone in particular? Definitely not, Carly spat, as Anne said, yes and no. What we mean is, Anne explained slowly, glancing at Carly, our father-in-law passed away two years ago, and the thought of him lurking around gives us the shivers. Got it, I said. You're in the clear, for the moment anyway. He's not here now, but he does lurk around a lot, Claire said, matter-of-factly. He's allowing himself to deteriorate, giving himself over to the darkness. You know what, though? I said to the women. If you want to be sure he never comes around, I can email you some links to easy protections you can wear or even put around your properties. Anne smiled. We'd appreciate that. Thank you. Again, silence fell over us, and I wish that it could just stay that way. The yard was incredibly peaceful. Brace yourself, whispered Claire, ruining the mood. I sighed and savored a bite of donut. There's more, right? You weren't just wondering about your father-in-law? There's more, Anne said quietly. So what's going on? Voices coming from a sinkhole back there are telling her about the end of the world. 
Carly gestured towards the water. Way to just lay it all out there. She's going to think I'm severely mentally ill. Anne smoothed her caramel highlights and drew in a breath. It didn't all happen at once. It came on slowly over the past month. I mean, maybe that's fast, actually. I don't know, but I did talk to my therapist about it, and she doesn't think I'm schizophrenic, so... Though I was thoroughly rattled, I attempted to smile reassuringly. The term end of the world shot a spike of not so much fear as intuitive resignation through me, as though I knew this conversation had been coming for months. Like, deep down, I'd known that at some point, I'd be sitting across from a person who would break the news. The dread humming in the background wasn't just caused by the relentlessness of these past months, that ever-present foreboding warned of something much worse barreling towards us. I really don't think tiptoeing will benefit anyone in this situation, Carly insisted, her long hair swaying as she shook her head. We have to tell her what's happening, right? That's why we asked her to come. I'm just not so sure this is such a good idea anymore. We're neighbors and... Anne, we've talked this to death in circles and we can't find a way to stop it. We have to let someone know, right? She's the perfect person to help us. I know you're right. I just wish we could be a little more anonymous. I shoved a bite of donut in my mouth as they discussed whether or not I was the right person to tell their horrible secret. After some more back and forth, I spoke up. Are you the only two who know this is happening, aside from your therapist? Anne swiped at her eyes and ran the sleeve of her Lululemon sweatshirt under her nose. We haven't told anyone. Not even our husbands, Carly confirmed. They wouldn't understand. Anne added, an edge in her voice. Would you like to go see the pit? Carly asked, moving to get up from her seat. No, I sort of yelled. I mean, not yet. I, why don't you just tell me what's happening, and then maybe we can go take a look-see. Okay. A couple weeks ago, I started waking up early, around four in the morning, and I just couldn't get back to sleep. I was anxious really anxious, but not about anything in particular, and that doesn't happen to me very often. I reasoned it was just back-to-school nerves. I was concerned that the kids might be sent back to remote learning, and my oldest, name omitted, has learning differences that make it incredibly challenging for him. It's his junior year, so it's very important that he puts his best foot forward for his college applications. Carly made a sympathetic noise and reached for another donut. At any rate, the insomnia didn't strike me as particularly strange until along with it came the utterly overwhelming urge to go outside. I'd lay in bed staring up at the ceiling, willing myself to stay put. I attempted to read to distract myself or listen to an audiobook, but it was no use. The house felt so stuffy and restrictive. It was as though I couldn't get enough oxygen within those walls. Anne stared up at her beautiful home, then her gaze slid towards the river. It wasn't enough to step out onto the deck, she went on. I had this urge to feel the ground beneath my feet. Forgive me for interrupting, said Carly, but that is not her at all. She is not outdoorsy. Anne chuckled. So true. I wouldn't have walked across the driveway without shoes, let alone through the mud. She stared down her bare feet and admitted, In fact, I feel agitated. Right now, I struggle being this far from the ground, the earth. It's become a constant distraction. It's all I can do to get the kids off in the morning and Charles out of the house. I just want to be out there. I followed her gaze towards the edge of her property, towards the river. What exactly is out there? I asked. The sinkhole. I discovered it the third night my insomnia drove me outside. The first night, I only walked to the bottom of the stairs. I was too frightened to go out there. God only knows what comes out at night around here. Anne closed her eyes and drew in a deep breath. I resisted walking down to the water as long as I could. Carly reached out and squeezed her hand. I don't know how I didn't fall right into it. That's not true. I know why I didn't. But the idea of falling down into that pit, she shuddered at the thought. I would rather die. 
It's got to be because of all the rain we've had, right? Carly insisted. I've lost count of how many times our basement has flooded since last spring. Do you think there could be more? Anne asked shakily. Maybe we should warn someone. Carly shrugged. Anne's haunted gaze fell on me. They are silent during the daytime. I've gone down to check. It's only at night that I can hear them. And even then they seem to be loudest after a storm. That thunderstorm we had the other night, do you remember? They were the clearest they've ever been. You were outside in that? I asked in disbelief. That storm woke me up. Joey, too. The rain had been so heavy it felt dangerous, as though it would pound a hole straight through the roof. The thunder actually shook the entire house. I go out every night, Anne said quietly. I can't help it. How have you kept this a secret from your husband? He's a heavy sleeper. Tell her what you hear when you stand at the edge of that thing, Carly prompted. Anne pushed her chair back abruptly. Can we just... She darted towards the deck stairs and scurried down them before anyone had a chance to react. I exchanged a look with Carly. We stood and followed Anne, who was now pacing the lawn, taking deep, cleansing breaths and wringing her hands. Carly took a seat on the bottom step, and I stood awkwardly close to the deck, scanning the grass for snakes. They're all around, you know. I've seen a bunch in my walks, even a few in our yard. They want me to know the end is close, the end of what we know now. The seven say it will change, and the change will be very painful. Pain like humanity has never known. The seven? That's what they call themselves, Carly provided. They say there's no way to prepare, continued Anne. There is no stopping what was put into motion. Only some will survive. What the fuck is going to happen? I stammered. Anne shook her head and stopped pacing. I don't know exactly, but sometimes I get visions of water. Actually, sometimes I dream about a wall of water crashing onto the shore. Many shores, really. And there are people running, but it is hopeless. There are explosions. I don't know if they're man-made, but there are many explosions, and then a wall of water, and then people, and then devastation. What was there just isn't there anymore. I think I'm dreaming of actual places around the world, and I'm seeing what will happen to them. The dreams are all different. I mean, they show me different locations, and I see how those places come to ruin. It's water, always water. And then I wake up, and they call me out here to listen. And sometimes the ground sort of trembles while they speak, like they're moving around down there. And for the ground to shake the way it does, I mean, they must be massive. Anne looked over and gave me a tight smile. You'd think I'd be terrified, right? It's scary to talk about, but when I'm with them, I'm not afraid. But what they tell me, what they're saying, I don't know how much time we have. They haven't given you any indication of when this is all going to happen? I pressed. It's got to be soon, said Claire. Why do you say that? I asked. Why do I say what? Anne looked confused. She's talking to her ghost, Carly said excitedly. What did she just tell you? She thinks whatever's going to happen will happen soon, I admitted. Then to Claire, couldn't they just be trying to scare her? N gnomes aren't imaginative like that. Gnomes? I laughed. Gnomes? Carly and Anne mimicked. She's talking to earth elementals, so they have to be some sort of gnome, right? I relayed Claire's opinion. This is insane, Carly commented uselessly. Have you seen what they look like? I asked Anne. No, and I don't want to. Hearing their voices is bad enough. That gravelly, wet sound can't come from anything attractive. We stood and stared at the river. I wanted another donut, and I wanted to go home. Claire broke the silence. Ask her to show us the sinkhole. I sighed. Can we see it? Without a word, Anne began heading towards the water. Carly got up from the step and walked behind her without hesitation. 
I trailed behind them. About ten or so feet from the river, Anne stopped and pointed down. Carly stopped abruptly and turned back to look at me. I forced myself to walk past her. Grass as thick as sod abruptly gave way to a gaping, perfectly circular hole in the ground. I gasped. You have to put something around this, like caution tape or something. Anne shrugged. I've tried. They pull it down. I took the tiniest step forward, unable to resist my curiosity. Or maybe I was being called forward. Listen, said Claire. I closed my eyes and felt the slightest tremble beneath my feet and immediately stepped back from the hole. Did you hear anything? Anne asked hopefully. I shook my head. Liar, Claire sniffed. I ignored her. It's so close to the river, why hasn't it filled up with water? I read that Baker had actual caverns people could explore somewhere around here, so we were thinking that maybe this connects to one of those. Who? That guy who created the amusement park here in the 1800s, all of this belonged to him. Your property too, I'd bet. Ding, 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 Claire muttered. Shush, I snapped. Carly looked taken aback. Sorry. No, not you. What amusement park? The women exchanged a look. How long have you lived here? You really haven't heard about it. Brace yourself, Claire muttered. Just... Tell me. I tried to keep my voice steady. There's this guy, Wilson, no, William Baker, who owned over 100 acres around here at the turn of the century. On it, he built a ton of attractions, sort of like an amusement park for the time. He's the one who created Sabrina Lake. Really? That was the lake my daughters rode their little kayaks on all summer. Mmm, impressive, isn't it? said Anne. Someone's landscapers found the old bear pits a couple years ago. Wait, you know what? This is actually ringing a bell. I think one of my neighbors mentioned this when we moved in, I said. Google the Needham Historical Society. You'll find a ton of information about it. Most of his property was in Needham, but some extended into Wellesley. He tried to get this area incorporated into a new town, actually. Hygienics or something. Hygieia, Anne corrected. Sounds culty, said Claire. Anxiety, which had been mounting an attack within me since I'd first set eyes on that goddamn sinkhole, was beginning to interrupt my ability to think straight. I took another step back from the black pit and met Anne's eyes. You need to move. Her shoulders slumped. Will they let me go? I waited for Claire's response, then said, They should be tied to this specific property especially since it's right beside the water. So moving will break their spell. There's a house that just came up for sale on the other side of Livingston. I know the broker, Carly said quickly. Anne considered. The big white one. Yes, I'm sure she can get us in to see it today. But is that far enough away? I shrugged. Probably. Carly took out her phone and began scrolling for a number. Anne took out her own phone, I'll text Charles. I turned and walked back towards the house without another word, Claire alongside me, chattering the whole way. Holy cow, I have enough spooky listener tales to fill at least two more episodes. I plan to put another one out next Friday, but in the meantime, keep them coming. Go to ghostsintheburbs.com and click the tell me a story link to share your scary tale. Some of you have emailed your stories to me and I will try my hardest to read them for these listener episodes, but for now, the best way to share your tale is on the website. There, you'll also find the link to those cozy baseball style. I can't say baseball. This is my third time recording this, so I'm going to... Just say cozy baseball style t-shirts, but only until September 23rd. Check out the merch page on ghostsintheburbs.com for that shirt and a lot more. So until next time, good night, sleep tight, and don't forget your nightlight.